know, some interesting commentary about stormwater management and, and potential runoff in other communities. Um, you know, we are, you know, one of the most expensive parts of doing a development is stormwater management, and it's really hard, and that's why we have people like Justin who help us with it. But we have to comply with a Virginia state regulatory body that defines how we manage stormwater regulation, and there's a link with thousands of pages of regulations associated with that. You know, if you're interested in that, please go do your homework, but we'll absolutely have to comply with those specific developments. And it's not an easy problem for us to solve, but you know, the runoff and erosion argument doesn't need to be resolved with the problem. Um, uh, there's some questions about environmental impact of this type of development. Um, I'd like to, you know, just, I think the most important point of the slide is, you know, sort of our two local environmental advocacy groups, the Piedmont Environmental Council and Southern Environmental Law are supporters of the neighborhood model because they've argued it produces less environmental impact than, say, sprawl-oriented development or other types of development. Um, we've also preserved all key environmental resources and open critical slopes and stream buffers. We're not asking for any special extension. Um, and I think just, you know, to have a development that's right off of a major road that's just going to reduce trip time for people having trail access encourages people to walk or bike to downtown for a day. Um, there are some other questions about, you know, how are you going to pay for the schools? How are you going to pay for the impact? Just, just to make things clear, you know, as part of this development, the developer is responsible for paying for construction for roads and utility lines and striping. Um, any specific site improvements, we pay a lot of fees and permitting and things like that. So that's not a burden to the county to say build these roads that we're talking about. Right? We're not <coughs> spending money to build roads that don't come out of your tax dollars. Um, another question for, for schools and things like that. We also, as part of the rezoning, we make a cash profit payment. And cash profits are supposed to pay for the expansion of public resources that are directly impacted by developments like this. So the county buckets all of these expansionary projects in a potentially prison or stormwater <coughs> or school, and then they allocate those costs to the proper amount and then we pay that. So if the county's doing their job and calculating the fees correctly, these cash profits should offset that. Um, another another interesting point so I reached out to Faith, who's the economic development director, and asked her, what, what, you know, what are people actually paying? We have a new resident to work the whole thing on an average. So on average, people pay about $3,000 a person directly towards this county. But then there's another $3,000 in indirect costs, so that's lodging and sales tax and meals and things like that, and that basically covers the budget for county services. Um, so I haven't gotten formal comments back from the service authority. I had two pre-app meetings where they were in there, and they told me there were no staff <coughs> development. Certainly that might Um, there's my contact info. Uh, I'm an open book, so please call or email me. Happy to answer questions. I am doing another meeting in the middle of January with the Cory Farm and Joe Hay, um, and I'll answer some of Cory Farm's specific questions at that time. And Megan, I'm not sure what, if we do a resubmission, we have to do another public meeting. Um, not necessarily. I might come to update the group on where the project is and. and invite you, of course, to come, but I don't think it would be a formal community meeting um, necessarily. It would just be an update on where the project is and, and comments or questions about the comments and staff. Okay, can I say one thing, Kate, and I appreciate your detail about certain aspects of the project, but we want to focus on the rezoning. That's what we're here to talk about, not to get into too much of the weeds of the design of the community itself. And, and at the R1 up to the architectural what you're proposing. So Tom has a comment. Yeah, I, I think you made a serious mistake in that respect. Yeah. And, and it's right here, it's just future language. It says the center is the most intensely developed while the middle and eight span around the center becomes progressively more residential. So that's the most This is not a center. This just goes nowhere and that's what's not going to it. It's, it's, it's not a center. So essentially, according to the master plan, we would have a less dense, especially since it's on the periphery of the growth area. The second thing is that we can, as a community, consistently against our initial critical 
came to uh, somebody wanted to rezone on the corner of 240 and 250 there to turn it into a garden center. And that's, I mean, that's a good point. You know, I've talked with Ken Kyle and Megan way on that issue. I mean, certainly, you know, you can see that here from the comp plan. You've got green space over here. You've got this parcel that was taken out of the comprehensive plan and is no longer in it. But, you know, I think, you know, I think to say, you know, the 250 the Harris Theater Shopping Center, you know, is it center or not? I mean, it is center. As a matter of fact, yeah, I'd like to add one more point, <coughs> is that we rezoned the whole swap of land along 250 and rezoned it higher density, I don't know why we missed this, we probably did go, and moved that density from the 250 area to the northern part of the growth area. So we actually rezoned the lowest impact of residential development along 250. to maintain, you know, this is a scenic byway. Megan, do you want to comment about the um, density range? Oh, well, I, I mean, 
mean, my comment is I'll be looking at the, the comp plan. Look at the master plan. Right, yeah, the master plan. Well, the master plan is part of the comp plan and looking at the recommendations in, the, in my review. And like I said, I, I haven't done that. I believe Tom is probably more closely known the master plan than I do at this point in this area. Um, but that's certainly something we're going to be reviewing again. So. I 
I was just going to say the same thing. I live like directly across the street on Brownsville Road, that first road, the property, like the field and the house right there. So this would be in my vision line, much like Cory Farm is now. I like the, the um, what do you call that? The, the, yeah, the buffer. It looked more appealing to me than I thought. Um, so I guess I was trying to tell you guys something good, that it looks better than I thought, because I came here definitely not. <laughs> so you did a good job on that. But the safety, I mean, the suicide thing that is there that you have to turn into this property at that second entrance there, I mean, the. I, I was just going to say as a community suggestion, what you just said is that is here, no matter it was here before Liberty Farm got here, it was here before, I mean, I think before Cory Farm, given the age of our drivers, you know how many people drive, I mean, I've had kids drive through my field, like, um, just driving off the road, my, at the end of my driveway, he was killed at the end of my driveway, I, I mean, I don't have to get into details, so it was seen and all that, but I feel like with the it needs to be taken care of if you can make that happen and perhaps with, with since it's designated gross area, area from the county, I feel like it's happening and I want to be part of it happening and be smart about it. Um, that's not an issue that you tackle, but I'm hoping maybe with that development it might make improvements of that, like the stop sign. Um, and if people are coming, I would like it to look more like that and make these roads safer and um, just, uh, and. That's the only thing I could suggest to you as a property owner who is right there. I do like the the I way like too. The and the, too. I like the walkway too. Yeah, the walkway. people are walking. Down yeah, they the are. And it's, it, I can't walk to Harris Teeter and walk in my field, but if there was a, you know, crossing or even like a stop, I mean anything. Um, it, it just, uh, I have positive feelings about that, but there's a lot of other things that you guys don't have control over that I'm feeling like all these developments are really butting up against and. And that stretch of 250, I mean, that, you don't know how many people pass people yeah. on that suicide lane. I mean, I call, P, I mean, I don't know how to apply for BDOT to change something, but it's crazy. Yeah, and it's even harder because, you know, you want to do this 10 foot wide walk, biking trail, yeah. but then you have your neighbors that, you know, they're never, you know, it's going to take them decades to put it in, right? Yeah. Where you have to get these numbers, it's a really <laughs> difficult process to do the total road plan and yeah. all in, but yeah, I, okay. I agree with that. So I appreciate five, the buffer, that's from where I'm at. Thank you for that. And sir, behind sir, you, I think there's two of you guys both within the time. Yeah, period. my name is uh, Tim O'Loughlin. I'm a, a butter the property uh, in this development. And the board couldn't be here today, which they're very upset about. But they've asked me to, to show up. Steve Walsworth, the president, Ron Pansack, the treasurer, Gary Koenig, the secretary, and Brad Grant, a member at large. And they are pretty opposed to this development. And I'm not going to read the letter if we had more time I would or what have you but their concerns are the things that we've talked about dramatic increase in already bad traffic congestion no safe view to westbound highway 250 traffic for your ingress and egress in the uh, location that you've highlighted near impossible to safely cross 250 to head eastbound traffic signal may be needed at this intersection for safety traffic signal more than likely cause highway congestion as well during your presentation I wonder if when you went to school there if you were waiting 20 minutes as we are now to get by and that's done nothing but got worse over the years. Um, classrooms, so on schools, things that we've already talked about. Burden on stormwater, of which our system has issues that need to be repaired right now. If there's any objective to try and tie into any of that or, or share any of that, uh, that's probably not something that we would want to entertain. We're having failures right now. Uh, storm drain, uh, sewer as well. Uh, financial burden on the county to bear the infrastructure. We know you have the proper system as well. Um, and then the impact to, to be honest, our property values. Urbanizing this area is not something that's desirable to the folks of uh, Cory Farm. Um, in your presentation, you used the word urban repeatedly. And I would say that there's a key difference and echo the previous gentleman's <coughs> excuse me, comments. The key difference being that Liberty Hall, Wickham Pond, those areas were designated urban. <coughs> it's not blown up there, but they have the orange designation for urban density. This does not. This is neighborhood. And in the description of neighborhood, which I have here if anybody wants to read it, is primarily single family detached homes. This is not. Okay? So I would say that this far exceeds the original intention for the area. Okay? Those are my comments. I have evidence for the concerns if anybody cares to see them or provide links to them or any of that. But those are my primary comments. Okay. And okay. with like your anything you want to share with us, we can get out to the Bruce website. Sure. Yeah. There's a large number of people. Also, I'm also from Cory Farm, so a large number of people that sort of gotten together and said this is really largely not in our interests. When you look at the map.
master plan in the areas for development. The areas that are currently zoned R6 are orange on the map and are only in a couple of spots. This part of the eastern part wasn't really intended similar to what, uh, what, what Tom had said. It's not intended to be high density, um, high density property. So right now, how much of this area is zoned as R1? And what's the current zone, the rest of the current zoning for the part that's yellow on the map? And why are you going up to a density of, of uh, of R6, which is actually an urban density, which there's nothing in that area, say Liberty Hall, but it's actually zoned that way. So the current, current parcels are all zoned R1. And I think the parcels to the back this way are also R1, which was just the total of 12 total questions you asked for the acreage of the parcel. No, the question was just in terms of the in terms of the zoning, you're basically going from something that's marked on the master plan map as being part of its green, as in markedly R1, not really earmarked for development. And you're basically going to essentially try to put in a community that's actually the highest density of the areas around. It would be one of the highest densities ever. But within Crozet, you're zoning at one of the highest density zones for this area. Well, just to say one thing about that, just to make sure, because it was came up earlier, I want to make sure I'll show it in time in terms of where. When we count the, the six units in per acre, it is based on the yellow area. So I think there was a question earlier about, well, it's like 20 acres, but you can only build on a small portion of it. We're only counting the portion that's built for park density here, just to be clear about that. It's not like a 20 acres times six units. It's the buildable area times six units is the threshold. So I just want to make sure that's you're talking about you're talking about almost 100 units by your units next to the Cory Farm. That's maybe 30, 66, 66, 66, 66 so even larger, like, even larger than. The, let's say hypothetically we did go R3, right? So well, what does that mean in terms of impact and changes? It basically means we have the same layout that we have here, and instead of having you know 40 foot wide attached unit here and here, we could get like a 50 foot wide single family, right? And then we lower some of the density here, so the impact is essentially the same to the neighbors between R3 and R6. You know, and you, I mean, yeah, you have twice as many Certainly people. not. I, I would yeah. contest that strongly. Well, I think, I just think from a, from a visual standpoint, from a road standpoint, sure, you know, you have 30% less traffic or 40% less traffic, but the reality is you're still gonna have the same sort of units that are on here, and it looks pretty much the same. Right, and, and so then the other, the other thing to consider is if we go that route, then we're building half a million dollar plus homes and it becomes not affordable for a working class type community and that's certainly an option um you know i don't know what the county's opinion on that is but you know i don't i don't think it's not going to work at an r3 i think the reality is we just can't change the type of units and the type of market we're going after you some of the consternation that folks are having now, you know, 15 years ago, people had the same concerns about Corey Farm. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's part of the process. Another half of uh, that farm. Uh, thanks. Um, for the meeting of Corey Farm, I think it would be helpful if you guys have done any analysis on what easements or connections that would be required for this 
um, this development I think it would be yeah, so we'll helpful a, for the community to know in advance by the way I live in Philly Run just a, a few houses down from the, the property line so we'll, we will need a wastewater easement and we did look at connections for a farm but there's no easement for any of those areas any temporary construction <coughs> It's possible, it doesn't look like, you know, if we're able to move the main entrance uh, further down to 50, then we'll be on it, so. Um, thank you, and um, again, this is the beginning of this process. There'll be more time for public input, um, and um, my, it is my understanding that the CPAC will meet again, um, you know, before the convening of the Public Planning Commission. Um, so we wanna continue to provide information to community members and hear from community members. I think So the Crozet Community Association, the Downtown Crozet Initiative is now a subcommittee of the Crozet Community Association and we'll meet, the, the DCI group will meet tomorrow in this room um, at noon to continue the conversation with Frank Stoner about the development of Barnes Lumber and the Downtown Crozet, Crozet Initiative. So if you're interested, we encourage you to come. Um, there is a website, downtowncrozetinitiative.com where things will get posted. Um, we'll also post information and connections to that at the Crozet Community Association's website, um, crozetcommunity.org. That's also where Kyle's info on this, some of it's already posted, what he provided before the meeting and what he provides after the meeting will also be posted there as well. Um, so I encourage you to stay involved in both this process and the downtown Crozet initiative because in many ways they are linked together. It's all part of the picture of what we want Crozet to be in the years to come. Thank you guys for coming. We really appreciate your input. I know there's lots more comments.